Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Many of you joined us downstairs for the naloxone or Narcan training, so I've already introduced myself to you, but for those who did not attend, my name is State Representative Melissa Jebrin. I represent East Haddam, East Hampton, and part of Colchester. This forum is being videotaped, so it will be available for folks in the future. Um, and so I do appreciate, I want to say a special thank you to the Connecticut Television uh, Network, uh, CTN, which is really the eyes and ears of the cap and they were very uh, gracious to uh, offer to come out to East Haddam tonight. So thank you for making this available to so many more people than are here joining us today on a little bit of a warm afternoon. Uh, the panel I'll be moderating, we're really fortunate to have um, just a lot of great, not just individuals, but the talent uh, of the individuals and really the stories that I think are going to move you and hopefully others uh, that we hear from tonight. The, what I'm going to have... Uh, each one do is introduce themselves and then we'll come back to the commissioner uh, to start the forum. So commissioner maybe you could begin by introducing yourself. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, I'm Commissioner Miriam Delphin Rittman, Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And I will say that we don't have microphones, so your, your loud voice would be great. The microphones we have here are for the CTN, but not necessarily for the people in the audience. So okay. your big voice would be great. <laughs> Kim, I know you have a big voice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do at times. Um, my name is Kim Richards. I'm here with the Roadway of Hope, the Middlesex County Division, or, or chapter, I should say. And uh, we are a sister group to the Roadway of Hope. Help. My name is Anna Gopian, and I am the founder and executive director of TriCircle Incorporated. I'm very fortunate to have made friends with the Roadway for Hope, and uh, also a uh, co-facilitator for a Hope and Support Group, hopefully uh, many more in the near future, um, and an organization that is being released in three phases that we can talk about if uh, the question comes up. Good evening, my name is Tad Varis. Uh, I'm here to speak on the roots of addiction. Uh, I myself, I'm in recovery from heroin use. Uh, my clean date is January 24th, 2014. And uh, I'm just blessed to be here to be able to share my experience, strength, and hope with you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And uh, Commissioner, maybe before we uh, begin, uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit about this really inspiring and quite moving quilt that we have behind you and maybe you could start with that before you talk about the things that are happening with the agency. Thank you. Uh, so, so the quilt that I have behind me is, it's part of an initiative that we, that's uh, going on right now where we're developing essentially a series of remembrance quilts. Um, and the idea is to provide opportunities for people who have lost family members, friends, loved ones, uh, to come to a quilting event and develop a tribute um, in honor of, of, their, of their loved one. Uh, and so the, the, the plan ultimately is to display these, these quilts in schools, um, when we have um, events like this, uh, at the legislative office building, um, to help raise awareness um, about the, the crisis that we're experiencing as a state and as a nation, uh, to, to uh, also share information about resources at, at various events and services that are available and programs. and. Um, I think a thing that's been so valuable with this initiative is um, when people come together, they're often sharing, you know, stories about their loved ones, and, and, and that alone has been really powerful. Um, people connecting and, and being able to, um, to, to really connect with others and see that they're not, they're not alone, uh, and to share information and resources and just to have that healing space. Um, so one thing that we're doing is we're making this available if folks are interested in checking it out to display it in any of their events, um, it is available. Um, they just have to contact our office and essentially we'd like for it to, um, to travel around the state. Uh, in August we'll be displaying it in the legislative office building and by then we anticipate that we'll have probably about three, three more, maybe four. Um, and so again, the goal is to just help to raise awareness and honor um, individuals uh, that, that we've lost to this addiction. So. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. And you know, while there was Narcan training going on downstairs, I was spending time up here with the mother of someone who just uh, recently overdosed uh, this year. And we are looking at this 
and it was so inspiring and moving to her. And so we're talking about doing uh, some uh, similar event uh, maybe in the fall when school begins. But Commissioner, if, if I, for instance, wanted or somebody else wanted to have this displayed at an event, would they just simply call the department yes. um, and arrange that? Yes. Great. Yes. They can call the department. Uh, they can contact Michael Mashad, my chief of staff, uh, or also or Diana Lajardi, who is our public information officer. Uh, either one of those two, even Daryl McGraw, even me directly. So just contact email, me directly. Just an email to email the agency. And All right. to you. <laughs> well, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Commissioner, I was hoping you could uh, start by providing an update, um, certainly on what's been happening with the agency. I know there's a lot of concerns with the budget, um, and maybe there's a, a way you can uh, share how the agency is still providing, still moving forward, and what that looks like. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. And you know, before I do that, I do have to say just, you know, thank you for bringing us all together, for your leadership, for your advocacy in this area. Um, this is the second forum that you've put together that I've attended, and so I just appreciate your leadership and work in this area. I think it really means a lot. Uh, and and is, it takes all of us working together, and you're, you've absolutely been a leader in, in, uh, in this area, so thank you. Um, so in terms of what we have going on, you know, we, we have been, um, in addition to our state funds, we've been applying for um, anything federally or that we're even remotely eligible for, and thankfully we've been fairly successful um, in getting grants. And so um, we have one initiative right now that uh, we were able to fund uh, with state resources that we're looking to expand. So essentially with that, we're having people in recovery. Uh, so recovery coaches connecting with emergency departments so when, that when somebody um, overdoses and is brought to an emergency department um, or if they have alcohol intoxication or you know any substance um, issue and they're brought to an emergency department, they're then connected with the person in recovery. Um, and then that person in recovery essentially lets them know about um, services and treatment that's available, lets them know that you know what, that they can get to the other side of this, that recovery is possible. Uh, and you know we launched that program in April, um, and already out of 100 and maybe 20 or 15 or so people that they've um, that they've connected with, uh, they've linked over 100 people to services. Uh, and so you know sometimes it's not on the first you know sometimes not on the first time the first contact sometimes it's a third or the fourth. Um, but what's wonderful about the recovery coaches is that they help to give hope. Um, and they continue to call people. So it's not just one phone call that they'll make or two phone calls. They'll, they'll keep calling three or four times to let people know that, you know what, you can get to the other side of this. So that's um, one initiative that we're, we're really um, pleased about. Uh, and uh, we're looking to expand that through a grant that we received federally from SAMHSA, so the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, that grant is $5.5 million uh, a year for two years. Uh, another initiative that we're expanding through those resources is our access line. Um, so our access line is a 1-800 number um, that you can call. And now, in addition to talking to um, a person that will connect you with services where you can get, uh, receive an assessment, um, we'll also provide transportation. Because um, one thing that we've been hearing as I've been doing these forums is that transportation is a challenge for folks. Sometimes getting to um, services if a person is under the, un under the influence or just doesn't have access to transportation. Uh, public transportation is, is not available uh, if it's in the evening or you know, at some other time. Um, so we'll also provide transportation now. Um, and again, that's funded through, uh, in part through this federal program. Um, you know, we also offer a whole range of um, services from inpatient detox to um, outpatient. We have recovery centers, uh, just a range of uh, addiction services and supports. Um, so those are just some of the things we have going on. Um, I know you've wanted me to talk a little bit as well about the, the budget and uh, and some of what we're uh, what's being proposed related to Blue Hills. Um, so Blue Hills is our uh, is a branch of our Connecticut Valley Hospital. Uh, there's an addiction unit there, and, and one piece of, at this point it really is a proposal, and I think that's uh, you know what I've. Uh, it's important to remember that you know we don't have a budget yet, and so this hasn't been voted on. Um, but but what is in that proposal is that the uh, 
21 detox beds that are currently located at Blue Hills in Hartford would move to Connecticut Valley Hospital. Uh, and then there's also 21 mental health beds that those would, or 16 mental health beds, um, that those would move to Connecticut Valley Hospital as well. Um, and then there are 21 rehab beds. Um, and what's on the table now is that we would privatize those uh, and keep about 25% in the Hartford region. Um, these are challenging decisions and, and some of what the goal was was to find a, an innovative way to save resources and but not reduce services. So this is not, there's no net loss of beds with these proposals. Uh, it's just moving the services from one area uh, of the state to the other. Um, but we'll provide transportation if, if somebody needs help getting there. Um, so that, that's one of the things that's, that's on the table in terms of the budget. But again, it's, um, it's, it's not final until it's voted on. And so we'll, in the coming weeks, uh, we should have more information about the budget. Um, Thank you. And, and you know, when, uh, for those who don't know, um, I happen to be the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, uh, and uh, we had a lot of folks come before us uh, during the public hearing process, which happened February, March, um, that talked about uh, that transfer, both pro and con, interestingly enough. Um, and so we'll um, see how that uh, develops. Just to be clear for folks, that was a governor's proposal. Um, since the governor's proposal, there's been, I know, I've worked on seven, my caucus, seven different budget proposals. Personally, I've worked on three. Um, so, and then our colleagues on the other side of the aisle are, are uh, going to have theirs ready soon. So, you know, there's a lot of things working at play with the budget right now. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Kim, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and kind of what your uh, goals and aspirations are as you continue to be an outspoken advocate for those who are fighting addiction and parents, most importantly, as well as the parents who are struggling with how to handle that? Uh, yes, um, as I said, I'm, this, myself and Cindy Robichard are the, fighting, are the founding members of the Roadway of Hope. And basically, what we're really trying to do is lift stigma and educate people. I mean, it's we, we're a Facebook group. I mean, however, we do have meetings and, you know, we do go out and talk to people and, um, you know, and what we're trying to tell people, even if you're not affected by addiction, you should really, you know, you should be educated on it. And a lot of people are resistant to education because it's not affecting them. And you don't want to get blindsided by it. So that's pretty much, you know, what we're trying to do. And we're hopefully, you know, trying to get our word out there where it would be nice if we could, you know, get into the schools. That's a bit of a barrier at this time, but um, pretty much. Can so I if you had to think about uh, the five things that you would want somebody to know today that you wish you had known mm -hmm. maybe at the beginning of your journey as the mother of someone who's fighting this terrible uh, demon of addiction, what, what would those things be? First of all, I would never say not my kid, A, right there, okay? And, and I did say that. And the second thing is, um, I was one of those that was very ju judgmental. I had, you know, a cousin who was addicted to heroin and, and you know, he broke the law multiple times and, and I just didn't want to be associated with them at all. And I was very judgmental, blamed my aunt and uncle who was his parents. Um, so right there, I would change. I would change how you know back then looking at it. Um, another big issue: prescription opioids. I, I so many people don't know that you know going to the doctor and and a lot of times these doctors are over prescribing script opioids. I mean, I had one person tell me her husband ripped his fingernail off, and he got 90 Percocets for a ripped off, I mean, he ripped off the whole thumb, fingernail, which is, you know, I'm sure it's painful, but 90 Percocets, okay? I mean, and that's how my daughter, it happened with her. She never, she didn't, 
She, honestly, she thought people who used heroin were losers. That was her thing. And she didn't start using, or I should say, fall into the spiral pattern until after she had her child and she was given Percocets for a C-section. And she found, because she did, she tends to deal with depression and anxiety, that these feel-good pills are great. and. You know, it led to Oxy to buying off the streets and um, doctor shopping and eventually heroin because she's, they, you know, her and my granddaughter's father depleted everything they had um, to buy the drugs off the street. So when you say it can't be, you, it, it, you know, don't say not my kid right. is a, a, a classic. Blindsided um, me. I mean, I started noticing, you know, little signs here and there, um, but I wouldn't have, I, I was hit with it blind. I had no idea. I mean, I started, you know, at one point I broke my ankle and, you know, the doctor prescribed me like 40 Percocets at that point and I didn't need all those Percocets and not thinking, I left my medication on the bathroom shelf and, you know, she stole half the bottle. And, you know, that's when I started figuring out, okay, she was last upstairs, you know, uh, okay, why would she steal my Percocets? Why would she take them? And when we did a forum, Kim and I did a forum at um, the Middlesex Community College with seniors. And it was, uh, if anyone's ever heard of it, it's called the Mile Club. And it's an opportunity for people, seniors mostly, to go to the community college campus and they learn all kinds of things. Might be an art class or an antique show or a flower class. We brought this uh, story to them. And so many grandparents said, oh my goodness, I never thought they would go into our medicine cabinets. And so it's that kind of awareness that I think is so important. We'll come back to you, Kim, and maybe, Anna, you could uh, tell us a little bit about your journey and, and, uh, and what's most important for you to have people understand today about why you're here. Thank you. Um, the most important, it's all important, and it's very hard sometimes to prioritize what needs to be the attention. Not only am I the founder and executive director of TriCircle Incorporated, I'm also a woman in long-term recovery, which means I haven't used a drug including alcohol since July 13, 1995. Congratulations. Thank you. And you know, I hear stories and, and I have the opportunity to witness the courage and, and tenacity of um, parents, guardians, and loved ones on a weekly basis. Uh, I, I run hope and support groups, and I'm looking forward to running more of them in more towns. We should have them on every day of the week. And so there is being requisitioned to other towns, and you know, they're coming and they're broken. Uh, their spirits are, are broken. And just as their loved one is broken, um, it's a systemic disease. You have someone that's suffering with the disease itself, but it's attached to the whole family. The dynamic is altered. So in the Hope and Support Groups, we try to address the self-care of the parent and loved one that is also fighting the same fight. And, uh, you know, it's amazing, you know, to take my lived experience and to be able to flip it as a direct amends to society and, and to my family. In, I offer the flexibility that I have because I cannot have children to people that do have children and loved ones. And there's 76 people on what I have brought together in, in a group called the Gratitude List. So wherever the uh, parent or loved one, guardian chooses to be on this list, that we get to work together on a weekly best basis. And it's another avenue for information and collaboration because just as well as the Roadway for Hope has a passion and a purpose, mine's a little different. But it shouldn't be siloed and separated. It should be joined and united. Because I'm going to tell you, as an advocate that, that loves many advocates, um, we are a bunch of very angry people. Um, and the best advocates are really just angry people, desperate for solutions. So, you know, going forward and needing to have a purpose for a reason for me to get out of bed because I am still shrouded with the, the shame and the guilt of my past, for a long time I was, I'll say. I am no longer held hostage by my past. I'm amazing, I know that, I don't need your approval. I know that, I've worked very hard. Thousands of dollars in therapy for that. And, um, <laughs> but I will say this with everything, 
It is the stigma and the isolated isolation created by the disease of addiction is just as detrimental as the disease itself. And I don't care what town you come from. I don't care who your parents are. I don't care the car you drive or your job. Because the disease has no mercy. Mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate to have found recovery work on my recovery on a regular basis in multiple ways of doing that. There's no one cookie cutter way of doing this. So I love it when I can unite with folks and make myself stronger and the community and humanity stronger. I mean, I have something to offer and it's not gonna be the same thing for every person. And, and it's, it's really amazing when you get to come out of the neighborhood and to find out there's a life far beyond your wildest dreams and you start dreaming. That's a perfect, that's a perfect segue to introduce uh, again the gentleman on the end um, meeting you earlier tonight and hearing about your inspiring uh, story and the fact that you're here is uh, just moving for me. So tell us, tell us a little bit and what you want people to know tonight. My name is Tad Varis. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. You know, as, uh, as Ms. Richards was stating earlier, like my, my addiction started the same exact way. Uh, I was prescribed prescription medication and um, the information, I wasn't given the information. You know, I had heard that they were addictive, but I didn't really understand what I was encountering until, you know, um, after three or four months, the doctor said, listen, we got to cut you off of this. And I started experiencing these, these drastic pains. And, um, you know, as she stated, I, I, I've resorted to buying from the street. And then, you know, the suggestion was made to me that, you know, you should try heroin because heroin's cheaper. And um, at that point, I was just desperate. And I, I did what, whatever I could to get by. You know, it, I didn't realize that it was going to lead me to stealing, hurting the people I love, prostitution, whatever it was. Like, I hit all those bottoms. You know, I overdosed. It led me to prison. And I'm grateful that, like, I was given the gift of desperation. Like, I had just had enough of it coming out of that overdose. And I, I just wanted to find a, a better way to live, you know? I mean, I unfortunately, like, you know, when we were looking at that quilt earlier, like, it really hits home for me because, like, I've been clean since January 24th, 2014. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, thank you. Like, I've, I've known, you know, pushing 100 people who have, you know, fell, fell to this disease. And it's, it's just really difficult to, to deal with it sometimes, but like I know that like by living in the process, like I get to be an example of hope to anyone that's affected by the disease. You know that like it shows that like you know this is possible. Like if I can do it, that anyone can do it, and I'm just grateful to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna drill down a little bit more. So if you could for me, when you were. Um, someone looking for help and you couldn't find it what would you, what would your suggestions be now what do you maybe wish maybe that you had picked up the phone and called a family member or access Demas's hotline what is it that you think people should know that they should try first I think that people need to realize the amount of resources that are available to them. I feel like when, when someone is in the middle of active addiction, they're so hopeless that they don't realize that there's a lot of people out there who are willing to help them and a lot of organizations that will help. You know, I was, I was homeless living in a car and people said, you know what, like, we got a spot for you, a safe spot for you to go to. You can go here and you can get clean. And, and at that time, I had no, no clue that these organizations and these, these places were available to someone like me with, you know, no job, no insurance, no anything like that. But you know what, like, places like that exist, organizations like that exist to, to help the people, you know? It's, it's such a problem that, like, you know, we have the, the ability to help people nowadays, and these resources do exist. So if people understand that, you know, I feel that they will be more likely to utilize the resources. So that's a good segue back to the commissioner because, you know, you launched your 1-800 number or earlier this year, but that's not the only way. If someone calls 211, uh, can they also find an, an access path uh, for help? Yeah, so if someone calls 211, uh, 211 can also connect them to any one of our walk-in assessment centers where, you know, individual, you don't need an appointment, can walk in, get an assessment, and then be linked to the appropriate level of care. 
Uh, for some individuals it may be detox and maybe they need a bed. For other individuals it may mean connecting them with an outpatient medication assisted treatment program. Uh, so it, you know, there's a range of services and supports. Uh, for other people it might mean connecting them to, you know, to one of our recovery centers. Uh, we have recovery centers in a couple, several different areas of the state, Hartford, Wyndham, uh, Bridgeport, where you can walk in and, and just connect with other people in recovery. Um, and Excuse me for one second, Commissioner. Is there anyone here who did not get their prescription filled by our local pharmacist downstairs? He's uh, available. If you did not have an opportunity to do that, just sneak back downstairs. But I think work, he's all set. Thank you. Sorry about that, Commissioner. Please continue. Yeah, so, so 211 can also link folks to uh, a range of different sort of services and options that are available. So if someone has, you know, these are some basic questions I know my constituents ask. If someone has insurance, should they call their insurance provider first to find out what, what their coverage is, or is it, is it pretty much uh, standard for most policies, for instance? You know, I mean, there may be some some difference in terms of policies, but in general, because of the parity laws, uh, you know, private insurance should cover addiction services. Um, but there, prop there, in some instances, are differences in what services they'll cover. Sometimes insurance doesn't cover um, long-term, you know, long-term residential stays. Uh, insurance typically doesn't cover that. Uh, so, so, for instance, I was reading recently. In, a, in an article where they talk about if you're up really late at night, I don't know if anybody else has the issue where you're up late and you're watching TV and all of a sudden you'll see an ad for some person who is dressed in a white coat but clearly they are not a doctor but they are dressed like one on TV, they're trying to tell you how great their <laughs> facility is. That, that's not the place that people, that's not the first call that uh, folks should be making. That's my sense, but I'd like to know what your opinion is when you see those kinds of things, or are they legitimate? You know, I mean, it, 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 there's probably a variation. You know, there probably are some that are, that are legitimate. Uh, there may be others that, you know, that, that maybe are less valuable. Um, you know, I think that the key is to start somewhere. You know, to start somewhere and and then sort of go from there. Um, sometimes some of the private sites um, are really costly. I mean, I think a person can start with their private with their primary care physician. Uh, you know, that that may be a place where they can get linked up if they have private insurance. Can be linked up to services. They can also call our one eight hundred number. Um, our one eight hundred number will also, even if you have insurance. You know, we generally deal with people who are uninsured or underinsured, so they're on Medicaid or Medicare. Um, so, you know, you can call the 1-800 number, and the 1-800 number will also connect a person to um, services that are available for folks that have insurance. Thank you. Yeah. Anna, I see that you wanted to, to jump in there. Yes, I did. Um, and it's Anna. Anna Gopian. Oh, thank you, because everyone says my name wrong, and I so know. I appreciate that. I've been that. trying to say your name right all night <laughs> in case I needed to utilize it. And thank Just you. Just go like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll smile and shake my head. It's, it's all you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a concern, and, and I'm not, um, I don't want to be confrontational, but I am concerned, and, and because I get such regular phone calls from folks and, and desperate, and emergency rooms, I'm so grateful to be part of um, CCAR, Connecticut Community of Addiction Recovery. I'm on their board of directors, and the fact that you're working together with them and providing the resources for recovery coaches yeah. in the emergency departments, emergency rooms, and but there's not enough, and it's, and it's money. It's always money. Um, so, being the fact Medicaid, Medicare, Husky, undersured, non -assured, getting a bed, it's great. My question, and I love to be able to find this resource, how many beds are in our state? Mm -hmm. How many beds are really available? Because what I do know, working in the field, is that there is a list that we're able to access, but if you don't work for the right agency, you don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. How many beds are really allocated to DOC and transitional living and, and care? You know, there's a, a gap that you're trying to bridge. We're trying to bridge. Yeah, I have a parent, her daughter died in that two-day bridge, mm -hmm. from DOC to the STAR program mm -hmm. at Merritt Hall. Mm -hmm. I know there's 60 male beds and there's 30 ma female beds. Mm -hmm. I know if the combination of substance being used isn't correct, you're not getting in. 
Now, to try to explain that to a parent and say, there's resources, and then start fielding back. What's your insurance? If you don't have insurance, do you have any money? I mean, really, when you're talking desperate, a parent will do anything for their child. And unfortunately, recovery is a marketable, mm -hmm. it's a marketable commodity, and there's a life at stake. Mm -hmm. And there's people that will take advantage of that. And so obviously, I, I, I have a lot more than one question. I'll, I could, and, and it's not. Well, that's not, kind of that kind of dovetail into why I asked about those late night commercials because yeah. I, I I'm sure there are parents feeling that desperation. They see something like that, as you said, marketing. So, Commissioner, can you? Out of state, I can get kids in the treatment out of state faster than I can in our own state. Mm -hmm. And at points in time, I've told that parent to drop their child off their insurance, and then there's this gap now of 30 days that they're going to check on you. Yeah. Right. So you can drop them and if we can keep them alive for 30 days we might be able to get them state services if the insurance that they've been paid for trying to create a sense of security can get them out of state or even in state you know? let's let's let the commissioner try and piece together yeah, uh, to, so that she can get you an answer we're going to take questions at the end now um you have no but you oh yeah yeah okay and there's no microphone. Yeah, there's no microphones in here. So when, yeah, outside, project it. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the number of beds. It's it's. You know, we could get that. I don't have a number off the top of my head in terms of you know across Demas, across Department of Corrections, across across um, hospitals. Uh, you know, so there are private hospitals. Um, you know, we have we we have a number of beds, but then it also depends on the level of care. Um, if it's detox, we have about you know 40. Uh, 42 beds, give or take, mm -hmm. at the you know the highest level of, med of detox. Um, we have you know a range of other beds at other levels of care. Um, but one thing that we find when we look at our data on any given day, we have capacity in terms of detox. Mm -hmm. We have capacity, so we run right around 98, 96 percent, give or take. Um, but that's you know again, we provide services for people that don't have insurance or that are underinsured. Um, for people that, and this is where Connecticut as a system, our system is often the term is bifurcated. You know, there's one sort of system of care for people that um, that don't have insurance or that are underinsured, and that's the state. The, you know what we often provide as a state safety net, um, and then there are services and programs uh, for people that do have insurance. So the, the um, private hospitals and private providers, um, and and there is some overlap because some of the community providers that we fund will also take insurance. So it, it, it our system is difficult to navigate, which is why we wanted to have the 1-800 number out there because it, it will help with that. You know, so if a person have, has insurance, uh, there there's a set of providers that they can work with. If they don't have insurance as a state safety net provider, then there are providers that we can connect them with. So, um, so it is complicated. There is a large group um, called the Alcohol Drug Policy Commission, and I am happy to be a member, of course, all the commissioners, including uh, Commissioner of Demas and DCF and the Insurance Commissioner. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, you know, when she talks about this and you talk about this bifurcation system. Mm -hmm. There was also some work being done to have a Connecticut plan, much like Rhode Island, and I know that in the doctors at Yale were kind of working on that. Is this an, the issue that she raised? Is this one of the things that they're trying to address? You know, it is, it is one of the areas that, is a, that has come up in the, alcohol, in the ADPC, so the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council. You know, how are, what, what can we do to increase access? Uh, you know, across across the board. You know, whether a person has private insurance or whether they have you know state uh, state insurance, um, and so that is an area that's being discussed both in the ADPC. It comes up also with the, in the core report, so the core um, sort of initiative. Uh, and it's true, the commissioner uh, Commissioner Wade is part of the ADPC as well. Um, so this is a you know this is an ongoing um, issue. Parity laws, though, the parity laws suggest that. Uh, you know, addiction services uh, need to be covered at the same rate or the, the same ways in which, uh, you know, primary care services are covered and insurance providers need to cover those services. 
Um, and so we do have a Department of Insurance that actually does quite a bit of advocacy uh, that they'll help people um, advocate with their insurance companies around covering services that should be covered but that maybe the insurance companies are saying they're, they're not going to cover. So they do quite a bit of advocacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the Department of Insurance, uh, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Uh, the Office of the Healthcare of Advocate is a great resource and I would just say for those who aren't here but maybe are going to be watching this uh, later on, you know, call your legislator. If you're having an issue with having something covered and you have insurance, they can get you directly to the advocate as well. Um, so we're talking about kind of the back end, but Kim, I'd like to go to you to talk about a little bit of the front end. One of the things that I think was very helpful at an earlier forum that we did was the signs of drug uh, abuse and how a lot of parents didn't know what to look for. And maybe you could talk about that uh, briefly. The hardest thing with my daughter was she wanted to sleep all the time. I mean, and she, you know, the problem was is she was abusing um, benzos as well, benzodiazepines like Xanax, Klonopin, you know, things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, and her eyes were always red, but she told me it was allergies. And at first, you know, I. I okay it's a time of year for allergies I really wasn't paying attention so look for that all of a sudden look for their um, hygiene you know they start to go downhill taking a shower you know um, I always know when my daughter's back to using because it so throw on anything I mean you know so burlap bag she'll throw it on I mean it's just I always know at that point um, also, you know, they're often, um, their skin, their skin is often like almost like an ashen color when they're using heroin and, and they're all, always, um, often too itchy, you know, the narcotics causes that. Um, How about some of the paraphernalia that you might not have recognized as paraphernalia yeah, early on? Yeah, I also noticed, and, and it really didn't even click till Anna one day started showing me us, Cindy and I, the little tricks, you know, of the trade. Um, I saw a lot of bent um, magazines mm -hmm. uh, when Anna started. I didn't even, it didn't even click until like eight years later. What do you mean by that, Kim? Can you explain what they're doing with that? Sure. I've, I've created something that took about three years, and it's in production and pilot now. Uh, it's called the Paraphernalia Project. Mm -hmm. And the hopes is to be able to share with parents and, and loved ones, uh, teachers, professionals, about the residual and paraphernalia about substance use disorders. And not just for opioids, but it's, it's old school to me. Uh, a magazine that would have corners cut out of it would be a part of a marketing process. M more so um, with the cocaine than it would be a, um, an opioid, but it's anything works in the matter of time. So you can flip a quick package off the corner of a magazine. So if you've ever found a magazine that's missing corners, you're, you're breaking something up for a marketable, you know, resourcing and however you want to say it. But the cottons, uh, the that's small elastics, yeah, that's what I'd like the to caps and covers of a syringe, yep. you know, because if you want to talk more specifically about um, opiates or opioids, and then the spoons, things like they're missing, you don't have any all of a sudden, and you know you had a whole set, you know? Things like that, it's unfortunate. And also what I found really odd is when she was living in her home, I mean, one thing my daughter used to be into um, was antiques, like collecting old bottles. Mm -hmm. um, and in the basement, I started finding these white, like almost like, I, all I can think of is Coke bottles, burned. Mm -hmm. They were, it's some type of, I don't know if she was smoking crack or what it was, but I, all of a sudden, you know, I started seeing they're using those devices as paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess it was to smoke crack at that point. Mm -hmm. Do you um, have anything you want to add uh, to helping parents identify um, what you, what what it is that they they might be looking for at the beginning of someone's addiction? I would I would say I would agree with the the hygiene. You know, for me, like that was the biggest thing that I slipped on was my I wasn't taking care of myself. You look great. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, also, um, 
like tie offs like belts, shoestrings. If you notice, like the shoestrings are out of the shoes. That's how I got caught all the time. Also, I, I wore long sleeves in the summertime. Um, you know, I had numerous track marks that covered my arms. And um, I would always just say that I was cold, but really, I just didn't want anyone to know what was going on. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Commissioner, we talked a little bit about the budget, kind of some of the, those initiatives. Um, any laws that were recently uh, enacted that you could uh, talk about? And I know, you know, we were obviously involved in some of those, but I'd like you to talk about some of the new things that, you know, we're trying to address, and then we'll take some uh, questions in a few minutes. Yeah, actually, this past session, so, so Connecticut, we've been uh, every year except 2013 in the last probably five years we've had laws that have passed um, to address the heroin and opiate crisis. Um, this past year there was a law that passed that uh, will reduce the number of pills that a first time uh, prescription, the number of pills for first time prescriptions for young folks. So it's, it went from seven pills, now it's down to five. Um, so that's significant. Um, there's also a provision in this bill that will um, allow somebody to have a no, sort of a no prescribing order. So it's a form that they can have, give to their physician to let their physician know, you know what, I don't want, a, I don't want an opioid. Um, if something happens to me, I want uh, some other non-addictive pain, uh, pain management medication. That's significant. Um, and then there's also quite a bit in the, in the new law, again, that, that passed this past session um, around disposal of medications. Um, so now home, home visiting nurses or home health aides uh, can work with the person that they're working with to help to safely dispose any unused medications. I mean, that's significant as well. Yeah, uh, we, and if you didn't already know this, um, you can um, br take prescription drugs back. We don't have an East, ha East Haddam, we don't have a police uh, force here all the time where you can go somewhere 24 hours a day and drop it off, but at Troop K, there's a box there. I do see Carl here, who is our resident uh, 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 police officer. Maybe when we get to the end, you can and uh, talk about some of the things we can do uh, for that too in East Haddam and yeah, Commissioner. Yeah, related to that, if I can add, so last year across about, I think it was like 65 or so drop boxes, uh, so again, these are located in police departments around the state, um, 33,000 pounds of unused medications were collected. Wow. Can you imagine that? 33,000 wow. pounds. Yeah. And so the thinking is about 45 or 48 percent or so of that were opioids. Yeah. Um, so that's significant. That really is significant, especially because we know a lot of the research suggests that, that for many people, uh, their addiction started from pills, mm -hmm. started from pills. And one of the things I learned on the uh, council is also the, how the, not this year, but the previous year, there was some new laws enacted regarding veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a local vet uh, contact me. He was upset about some of the reporting requirements that were underway for him, um, but it was really, you know, his lack, he didn't have enough staff to be doing it. And at first I didn't understand until I actually went to a council meeting and learned that people were um, faking illnesses for their pets and getting uh, uh, pres opiate prescriptions for their animal, but they were actually taking it themselves. And I know, I. I, I I believe it, but you know, it's like those are the things you don't think about. Do you have any um, any other data on that? Did you? I mean, when you were people coming to you and asking for this, is that why um, the change? The change in terms the of the change in terms of the veterinarians being part of the prescription yeah. monitoring program. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think because that's emerged as a as a problem, as a pattern, uh, that that's been included. You know, and I think the goal is to really reduce the likelihood of somebody um, doctor shopping or having more access to more pills than necessary. So, yeah. what an yeah. avenue to utilize a pet. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not thought of, and yeah. not even just the, it's for like anxiety for pets in thunderstorms or pets in travel. The benzodiazepines are much more popular, but so is the ketamine. Mm -hmm. Another, um, what is, um, can you say what that is on a ke ketamine? Um, kids are utilizing it in different ways. It can be smoked, it can be shot, it can be, uh, it's an additive and a sedative for animals. Oh. So a lot of you might have heard the K hole. You can go into a K hole. So it's it's and it's also utilized to um, 
make someone unresponsive. So they can be date raped, they can be taken advantage of and things like that. So it's it's stolen. So crime rates going up with veterinarians, not just because they're utilizing their pet to acquire, but they're being robbed on a regular basis. So and these are the things like, you know, that you who would have thought? And I certainly I certainly didn't. Is there anything else the panel would like to talk about before I open it up for questions? Kim. Yeah. Um I wanted to talk about, you know, when they had the heat um, presentation with State's Attorney Robert Spector a couple a week or a couple weeks ago at the high school, mm -hmm. one of the things he opened the door for me to really implore with people is, you know, prescription drugs with your kids. And, and I'll tell you why I was hesitant when I've had parents call me and say, hey, my kid broke his leg or whatever. What do I do with my child? when they get opiates, I'm scared to death they're going to become addicted. And I, I was afraid to advise because I'm not, I don't carry a degree. I'm not, I don't have a medical degree, you know. I was told by an attorney I could set myself up for a lawsuit, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But State Attorney wow. Specter, who obviously also is not a doctor, opened the door for me and said, you know, monitor the use of opioids with your kids when you get a prescription. Um, you know, you don't ha try to advocate for non-opioid meds. And one of the things I wanted to share with people is um, our officer Carl, a couple years ago, his son broke his, badly broke his jaw in, in playing softball. And one of the things he did, and which I thought was remarkable, was he alternated with using um, um, Motrin in between, you know, because usually when you get script opioids, it's take, I don't know, depending on the pain, one to two every four to six hours. He was instead alternating with Motrin, he was cutting the opioids in half, and, um, you know, he constantly monitored his pain levels at every four hours. I think that's what we should do as parents if our kids get hurt. I mean, you know, we, we normally don't we just blindly accept what our doctors give us. We don't question them. We have to. We have to. Because honestly, I don't think doctors are, a lot of doctors are educated in an addiction. I really don't. So. Thank you. Anybody else want to uh, uh, have any I'd like comments? I'd say or? that I started a relationship with uh, Tony McCabe, the director of youth services in town, in hopes of bringing a hope and support group with a name of uh, Roadway to Hope for hope and support for parents in this town. So I really wanted to, you know, utilize the name and the resources that the town has. So it's only funding, right? So we just need to find the funding. I've already provided the the proposal letter to her uh, just a couple days ago. We had a great phone call. She was open to that. Uh, and I know that we want to collaborate. And a lot of times people build walls and I want, we want to build bridges. So mm -hmm. I think... Okay. It gives other people another way to go from town to town, too. Say if we have three, four different groups on different days of the week, those people make relationships and they become their strongest allies is the people that are actually living with the situation. And Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, so because we don't have a microphone, if you have a question, I'm just going to repeat it so that people who are listening to the tape can understand what the question was before, it's re before we get a response. So somebody had their hand up over here I saw earlier. Did you have, your, did you have a question? No? Nobody has a question. Carl. Not a question, but I just want to applaud Anna for all she's done in our town at Grassland Cats and all the meetings. And Kim, tireless effort helped so many people. I, I think these people are wonderful. Thanks, right? Carl. Yeah. So there wasn't a question for those listening at home. It was just some kudos for our uh, panelists, and I couldn't couldn't uh, agree more. Does anybody have a question for one of the panelists? Yes, and I just need to repeat it for the camera. Go ahead. So how can we help? How can just a, a normal parent? My kid's not in school. We homeschool, but how can what can we do? So the question was, how? What can someone do who just wants to help and? I don't know, maybe we'll start with the commissioner. You are helping a lot of pe people in a lot of different ways. So you have somebody who doesn't think that their family's in addiction but wants to be proactive besides the obvious talking to their children. What age should they start talking to their children? What should they start talking about? Maybe that's 
a place you could start? You know, I mean, I think it's never it's 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 never too early to start talking with with young people about uh, the dangers of uh, abusing not just opiates but alcohol, uh, you know, substances in general. Um, so it's certainly never never too early to start. Um, if your question was also how do you how can you get involved and how can you help was was that also part of your question? Yeah, you know, so there um, there are uh, regional action councils mm -hmm. and uh, local prevention councils that are comprised largely of volunteers. Um, we fund those through our federal funding. I think that is a great way to get involved. Um, our regional action councils or even our our regional mental health boards are so active with doing advocacy and getting information out to, around prevention, raising awareness. They do mental health first aid training, Narcan training, provider um, education around prescribing. Uh, there's quite a bit that they do and so we can get you information about uh, any of those if, if that's of interest. You know that's a that's a great point because in East Hampton when we had done an earlier forum uh, the LPC hadn't had an active group behind Behind them, and um, unfortunately, because of several overdoses in that community, people came forward and asked the same questions you did. And now they have a robust network of, of uh, folks, and they try and have meetings uh, sometimes in the afternoon, in the evening, just to have that resource available. So every town has a local prevention council, um, and those are volunteers. It's not political, uh, so you know you don't have to worry about those appointments or anything else. It's really a volunteer based and uh, that's one. You mentioned the regional action councils and mental health boards. They uh, are going to be struggling if they are right now because of the state budget. So anything that can be helped for them on a regional level would also be really, I think, powerful and important. Also, so through the grant that I talked about, that, that SAMHSA grant uh, that's geared specifically at the opioid crisis, um, we'll be infusing uh, resources at the local to the local prevention councils to work on prevention messaging around the heroin and opiate crisis. So that's um, that's uh, funds that have already been awarded um, to to DMIS, and so we'll be disseminating those um, through the racks um, to the local prevention councils. Great. Uh, yes, uh, gentlemen in the back. I just have to repeat your question, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm Paul from Hi, um, Dave. One of the big problems I've been seeing recently was a lot of forums we go to, but some of the girls going to tell stories. We go to the schools, and, and during the day, the students are all there, but they can do it for their parents. You, you get very few parents that show up at these forums. We've got we to do something about that. Stop parents from hiding at home. they got to come out, listen, and see what's going on. So for those listening at home, the comment was that there's really a lot of um, lack of involvement with uh, parents at night, unfortunately, and trying to get it into the school system. I will say that I know that the documentary, Chasing the Dragon, um, has been shared. I know it's been shared in my community and, and maybe uh, others. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that documentary and maybe would want to speak to that. Uh, Anna, I see you shaking your head. No, it's amazing. And, um, um, friends with some of the folks that uh, produced that, as well as Anonymous People and Generation Found, two other great movies. Um, and it is bringing people together. But sometimes the best conversations are when you bring them together without substance use disorders being the hot topic and bringing it up yourself. Sometimes the car rides are the best thing that can initiate a, a less threatening environment to open up to the vulnerable conversations. So that's really important. But, and I'm going to take it now that I got it. Another question, if I may, the racks. I, I love the people that I do know and have interacted with the racks, but as far as I know, they're on the docket to be cut. Well, that's why I just mentioned, yeah. they, you know, but that doesn't mean that their 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 state potential state portion of dollars mm -hmm. may be cut. They have fundings from other sources. They do. And but the five point five million dollars over the next two years, I mean, the, and you want to work with prevention and resources, they're the boots on the ground, and I just it breaks my heart to know the work that they do do in the thirteen uh, regional action <laughs> councils. That, that they're going to lose anything. They're already on a shoestring now. So, I mean, my kudos, my vote goes to <laughs> say the rack. All right. Um, Carl, you had had your hand up? Um, we know everyone's different, but what would you estimate 
like a long time heroin user, how much time in rehab, inpatient rehab, would you say would be a minimum to give that person a fighting chance? So I have to repeat the question, I'm sorry. So the question was, how long does a long-time heroin uh, user need in rehab um, but based on your experience? Because obviously everyone's different. So that's the question, Anna. It is. It's a great question, and I want to make sure I clarify. I am not a long-time heroin user. No, I know that. But okay. I'm just saying you, obviously you, you're helping people. Right, uh, right. And it, I just wanted to clarify. No, um, I know that. And, so the substance itself to be out of your system, and I'm not a doctor either. Yeah. I have an education with substance use disorder, um, drug and alcohol counselor, you know, social sciences and other things, but in also a recovery coach. And uh, I would say that the treatment that's offered, and it's depending on the institution and that you're utilizing, the agency and what they provide. I mean, yeah. people have to show up. So three to five days might might get the drugs out of your system, might. But you need months in reality. In reality, you can, like 15 months yeah. to heal a brain, the neurobiology of it and the understanding of what the, the disease of addiction is. I mean, it's the reality. You're just ripping the scabs and throwing people back on the streets. That's, I'm sorry, it gets really uncomfortable for me to talk about because it's almost like fielding the market. It's the recidivism, and you can't you can't arrest your way out of it. No, we, and, we know that. Yeah. It's, but you need to change your circle of friends, too. And yes. There's a lot of you know. actual boots on the ground for the person with the substance. The change is necessary. But if the resources aren't available, that makes it very challenging, too. So, and, and I'm a fan of what the state offers, if you can get in there, right? So if it's um, 2DE or um, the STAR program, and, and the different resources that are with the state. So when you get admitted, you're automatically working on the aftercare plan, automatically. And, and I gotta say, this is a really a passionate field. You have to really show up for this. And the self-care of the person providing the services is just as important too. And including the family, again, including the family, including the family in making sure wherever they go back to or go to next. Be, you know that conversation I actually had issues though with I tried to be included in an episode of care with my daughter mm -hmm. and the social my daughter you know signed the release did all the formality and the social worker said what is it your mother wants me to say mm -hmm. I just wanted to be included mm. and know how to deal with her through recovery because recovery is a nightmare just mm -hmm. like the act of addiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... It's, it's because it, it's the work doesn't stop My just because you're... I mean, that's change. really the key. In the field. There's a, you know, I, I mean, not wall, but the mindset in the field mm -hmm. needs to change. Right. It does. In 30 days, to like what Carl was asking, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, they consider that long-term treatment. Mm -hmm. Detox isn't treatment, so don't don't add in those days. That's just getting them in the door and starting the process of cleaning your system out. Mm -hmm. And then 30, 60, 90 days, that's if you're lucky, that's if you're lucky, and it's the continued care. That's just the beginning. The work starts when you leave, right. you know, and, and it's the environment that's conducive to that that's important. Yes, you had a question, and again, I need to repeat the question yes. because this is being uh, filmed. Um, my name is Christine Gadden, and I'm with the Roadway of Hope, and I wanted to kind of back up with detox. My son detoxed in a medically induced coma at New Britain General Hospital because I couldn't find somewhere for detox. As the roadway of hope are advocates for parents that have children that are suffering from substance abuse disorder, you're saying, Commissioner, with all due respect that there are beds, we're not finding them. We're trying to help people on a daily basis that reach out to us to find them. I couldn't find them for my son. The 1-800 number, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Wheeler Clinic is somewhere you can walk in and get assessed, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Addiction doesn't live on bankers' hours. Um, I was told I could bring my son to Bristol Hospital and he would be able to get detox. I sat there for six hours. 
over and over talking to people that said, yes, we'll let him detox. 48 hours after that, my son found him almost dead. That was April 10th of this year. So my thought and process, I know the money that we're getting from Demas is come, you know, going to be helping with education, which is so important to help the younger generation not get into this horrible, horrible cycle. But is there earmarked money, I know the recovery coaches, but for more sources for families to get people into detox, I, I just don't see it. I, we're, we so, as a group are looking every day for people, and we can't find it. We have three people right now, we can't get to the maze, we can't get them into detox. So the question is, um, you know, that's okay. Just that's okay. It's just nobody else can hear you, but 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 me. Um, so the question is, you know, people are struggling still, even with the 1-800 number, even with the the strides you've made uh, as the commissioner over the last few years. But when there's that emergency and it happens at one o'clock in the morning, not the nine to five hours, what is a family? What what is that worst case scenario? You must see see it. What is your what is your answer for that? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, 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 it varies. So the 1-800 is available 24 hours. So it's not just 9 to 5, you know, for one. Yeah, so that's so so in, in instances like that, I mean, absolutely let us know because it should be 24 hours. It shouldn't ring and ring and ring. It's 24 hours. Um, and so I need to know when it's not 24 hours because that's that's how we have it set up. It should be 24 hours, and that's what and we're a live expecting. commissioner just that's to make sure make sure person. I can under make sure everyone's clear. Yeah, it's, it's a, a live, live person. person. It's not a recording or anything yeah, it's else. Not a, it's not a recording. It's a live person, um, 24 hours. And so let us know. Let us know if you're experiencing barriers and that's not the case um, yeah so the other part of your question was you know uh, are additional resources being uh, put out to fund additional deto detox um, services or beds um, at, at this point that that's not where we're looking to invest additional resources at, at the detox level of care um, where we are looking to and where we are investing resources based on the SAMHSA resources we've gotten uh, and and even you know continuing with our existing state dollars are sort of evidence-based practices like inducting people on medication-assisted treatment um, in the emergency room. Um, and so that's, in, for some individuals, is, 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 is maybe more effective than they're going right to detox. Um, so by treating them on, you know, inducting them on medication-assisted treatment and, and treating them on an outpatient basis, um, and connecting them to community uh, recovery services and supports uh, and, and just continuing the treatment process on an outpatient basis allows them to remain connected to their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I'm not necessarily a proponent, you know, there's a lot of discussion around, well, you know, sometimes people may need to go away for two years or, you know, a year and a half. Um, when, my, a, when my son went to the hospital, they just turned him away. So where so that's going to be a new program if someone goes to the hospital for a quote unquote detox where they need help, then that would be introduced. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we we are piloting that at several hospitals uh, around the state where a person will be inducted on medication assisted treatment in emergency departments. Um, what that does is it, it immediately reduces the cravings. So if they're on either buprenorphine or methadone, it reduces the cravings and allows the person to then, uh, you know, begin the recovery process. You know, to be linked with a recovery coach, to be linked with other, um, you know, uh, counseling or outpatient services and supports. And the data actually shows that um, what helps a person often achieve long-term recovery is not a bed. The bed doesn't. The, the data isn't there for the bed. Uh, the, where the where the uh, findings are tend to be more positive is when a person is linked with MAT and connected to outpatient uh, recovery services and supports. Um, um, it could be methadone or Vivitrol or, or Suboxone. I know that that's, I, excuse me for a second, I, I know that, that we've been debating that a lot yeah. at that commission and, and you know it's no secret there that I'm not a fan <laughs> of methadone and so we've talked about this a lot and why we're not using Vivitrol because it stops it immediately and you know there's some people are saying it's way more long term 
methadone, there's a lot of people who feel that that's just a replacement and that it's not helping. So I know that there's a lot of different opinions on this, but are we using Vivitrol more? Is, it, is this SAMHSA grant have give you the ability to be to be able to use a variety of these tools in your toolkit or is the grant specifically for this medicine that you spoke about so some of it, the, the projects that we have you know some some of the sites actually may be using vivitrol as well mm -hmm. um, buprenorphine is an area that we're that we're focusing on we have quite a bit with with methadone already we probably have 25 or more methadone clinics around the state um, so we're focusing on buprenorphine and, and Vivitrol, you know, it's, it's valuable as well. There are drawbacks with Vivitrol, yeah. you know, and that's the thing. I mean, the, our goal has been to, um, to, to try to have as many options available as possible because we know there are multiple pathways to recovery. Mm -hmm. For some people, you know, they say methadone is what worked for me. It was helpful to have the structure, to have somewhere where I had to be daily, to connect with people, to participate in groups, you know, one or two or three times a week. Um, other people are, you know what, that didn't work for me. What worked for me is being, you know, only having to go maybe, you know, once a week or once every two weeks so that I could do other, you know, work or... I, I so. see the, you're nodding your head on the end there about the different types of uh, substances that are helpful in recovery. Maybe you could shed some light on sure. your uh, personal experience and... I, and I have plenty of personal experience. Um, I tried every avenue, every avenue of uh, drug replacement therapy. You know, I tried the Suboxone, the Subutex, the Methadone, the Vivitrol, and um, you know, personally, yeah. I couldn't stay clean on that. You know, it was until the the pain got great enough that I achieved complete abstinence. But I do, I do see the harm reduction that it does, mm -hmm. and how some people might need that crutch in the beginning to to keep a needle out of their arm. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 beneficial to start off, but again, it's a tool that needs mm -hmm. to be used appropriately. It's not a lifestyle that I should be going to a clinic for ten years because. So you, know, you you tried? Did I hear you say you uh, used all all of those medical? Um, replacements is that was that what I heard? Yes, you say? that's correct. So, did you use them all separately? Like this stopped working, so I switched to this, or well, how, how did that work for you? At the at the beginning, it started with methadone, and um, I kept the needle out of my arm, but I started using other substances, and then it went on to Suboxone, and I just wouldn't take it because it can't block it if I don't take it, and then I tried the Vivitrol, and. Um, you know, it's got a 30 day, it lasts for 30 days. If you wait 31 days and you want to get high, you just have to wait that extra day and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I have no experience staying clean on any of those. So it's really difficult for me to speak on staying clean with those substances, mm -hmm. but I can share the experience that I've had while using those substances. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, um, I'm Sorry, no, I, there's multiple people, but Commissioner, it's no, you, so go no, right ahead. I'll yield. I was just going to say I appreciate you sharing your story, and, um, and, and I think you really well highlight that there are multiple pathways to recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's journey is, is different just based on right. who they are and where they are in their life and their recovery process, mm -hmm. so thank All you. Right. I see we had a hand way in the back. Yes, ma'am? Yes. Yep, that's you. <laughs> So the question was about the new law. I don't know if the governor has signed it yet. That's officially when the law would take effect. So it came out of the House and Senate. Um, the governor signed it a couple weeks ago. and. It, not signed yet. So typically the way that works is once the governor signs it, then it has an effective date with the legislation. I would ask, I don't have it in front of me, but um, if you were to reach out to your legislator, you could ask them what the effective date is. Typically the effective dates are usually October 1st or January 1st. So I'm not sure what this law was specifically. And maybe Commissioner, you could answer the question about verbal versus only in writing. I believe it was only in writing, but, but I rather defer to you. So the law, the, in terms of what's in the law, it does say that, you know, the, the person has to fill out a form that the Department of Public Health um, dispenses. But, I mean, I, I think I think you could also have a conversation with your physician or, or your health care team and, and let them know that, you know, in the event of emergency, I don't want an opioid. So I, 
you know, the, the, the form certainly, you know, makes it concrete and on paper and it's a shared understanding and it's documented. Um, but I, my hope is that if you also have a physician that you've worked with, you know, and you have a relationship, you can. My son, who's a short-term recovery, where he went to the dentist for an access too. And with me in the other room, but able to hear the conversation between the dentist and my son. Five times my son said, I am in recovery, I can't take narcotics. Mm -hmm. And that doctor handed my son a prescription for 28 Vicodin and said, you better take this or you're going to regret it. Wow. Shame, 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 on, shame on that dentist. They thought I was there. Yeah. And my son and that's why this, and that's why the, that's frankly why this, that proposal was made. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it makes sense to have it in writing for, you know, in case the physician forgets or in case, you know, who knows what. But to have it in, in writing really does create a shared understanding. And particularly now as we have electronic medical records, then it become it can become part of a person's medical record. And I think really that was probably the intent with this part of the law, that it's uh, part of your medical record. And so then any other physician going into your medical record, if you're part of a healthcare system that has an electronic health system, um, would be able to see that. And, in your record. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's almost 8.30, so I'd like to be able to take, continue to take some questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. How did you get to the point where we didn't need any medication or medical you know, assistance treatment? How did you get there? What was your silver bullet? So, so I just have to repeat the question. So the question was, you know, how did you get to the point where all the assisted treatment that you just said no, line in the sand, I'm going to tackle this um, and 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 break the cycle. How 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 did that happen? It's a, we're so glad it did. But explain to us how. To be completely honest, uh, I was incarcerated, and um, I didn't do a long a long time in prison. But w upon being locked up, I was on 150 milligrams of methadone, and uh, I detoxed cold turkey on the floor of uh, an institution, and. Um, I vividly remember how that felt and the pain of going through that. And you know, I, I just knew that the pain was enough and I didn't want to go through that again. I know I know a lot of people who get incarcerated and their 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 main decision when they get out is I'm gonna get on, you know, drug replacement therapy because I won't I won't pick up if I do that. Now for me the substance was out of my body for long enough as to where I had the decision if I was gonna put the substance into my body or not. And I just made a clear decision that, you know, I didn't want to I didn't want to live that way anymore. Therapy. Um, I, I attend a 12-step fellowship, a support group, and I um, I utilize the resources that I have. I have a lot of friends who are involved in recovery with me, and um, I, I continue to go to those meetings today. You know, it helps me so much. And um, you know, sometimes you just have to share about what you're going through with someone else who understands and can empathize with what you're going through or what you've been through. I have two sons. The biggest complaint is how do you think about them? So where do you go to find friends that are sober? So the question was, you know, if you've had a lifestyle trying to stay sober, you have friends who may not be looking to be sober, how do you make new friends? How do you put yourself out there? You have to find people who are trying to achieve similar things that you do. You know, my, my father always told me if you lay with dogs, you're going to catch fleas. So, you know, you want to um, associate with people who are trying to achieve a similar positive goal that you're trying to achieve. So for me, it was finding people who are involved in recovery, people who wanted to better themselves as individuals. And, you know, it, you can go to any of the numerous 12-step groups that, that uh, are offered around. Or, or, you know, I go to school or some people do church. Like, there's so many different avenues and you know resources to utilize do but, you find social do you find social media um, in this day and age do you find that to be helpful at all 
Personally, I'm not a fan of social media. Okay. Um, I actually had my social media turned off for two years. Okay. Because um, I, you know, I see how I, I, I act out on social media, and sometimes it's just better. You know, I've noticed that if people want to communicate with me, there's so much more intimacy involved with picking up the phone or actually, you know, face-to-face, one-on-one interaction with somebody. That I don't need someone to like my status. You know, it's, it means a lot more when somebody, you know, calls me and says, "Hey, I just wanted to check in on you, see how you're That's doing." That's great. Mm-hmm. So the question was, if you have a if you have a family and you have someone in recovery, how, how do you handle somebody who might be a casual drinker, somebody having a beer? How do you how do you create a, an atmosphere where that person is supported? Well, me as as the addict, I have to accept that the world doesn't change just because I got clean. You know, my, I have people in my life who socially drink. I have people in my life who socially you know use drugs. Not I mean socially acceptable I guess drugs I don't really but um the point is like just because I got clean the whole world doesn't change and it just comes down to the people who respect me and respect the lifestyle that I'm living they choose not to you know put it straight in my face and you know like I have the choice to remove myself from a situation where I'm uncomfortable. If I feel that I don't like what's going on around me I don't like the people using or the people drinking around me I have the choice to remove myself from that. Mm-hmm. All right. Anyone else have any other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. My name's Adam. And I, I don't have a question. I want to thank you for putting this together and the whole panel. Uh, you know, some great information to share. Um, I am a person in, in long term recovery and a member of narcotics anonymous. And I just wanted to say, you know, that we are uh, uh, one of the possible pathways out there for, for recovery. You know, mm-hmm. I know that there's a brand new meeting on Tuesday night mm-hmm. right down the street. Mm-hmm. Two, uh, yeah, uh, I got it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, two, two, uh, two, rest, cats. two wrestling so, cats. You know, and, and I know that just started recently. You know, we have almost 300 meetings around the whole state. That's you know, wonderful. And, you know, there's multiple meetings every single night of the week. It doesn't cost anything to go to Narcotics Anonymous mm-hmm. meetings. Um, you know, and, and we've heard a lot tonight about, you know, changing those people, places, and things, and mm-hmm. hanging out with positive people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's one of the avenues to get it. Thank you. And so uh, for those listening at home, we talked a lot about uh, Narcotics Anonymous and how it's really across the state. Thank you very much for also mentioning the new local chapter here in East Haddam, and I'm sure there's many uh, in different communities. So what I'd like to do now is, as we're kind of wrapping up, you know, what final thoughts do you have, something maybe that we didn't get to cover earlier that you're kind of burning about, oh, I wish I had said that, just some final thoughts, and then I know the commissioner at least has agreed to stay a little bit later and talk to anybody as well after the forum as well as the participants. So, Commissioner, is there any final thoughts you'd like to share? The, the, a piece that's important for me just is for people to remember that, you know, recovery is possible. Um, it's important to be hopeful um, and and to reach out. You know, there are services and supports that are available, uh, whether it's recovery coaches or any of the, the um, warm lines or 1-800 numbers. And, and so just to remember that recovery is possible and, and treatment is available. Thank you. Kim. Um, my biggest, I guess what I'm thinking of at this moment is, is, you know, one of the biggest issues I have a problem with and I'm very sensitive to is stigma. Um, I tend to lose my temper at times over ignorance. Um, and one of the, my biggest advice to people who are not affected by it, you know, I, be careful what you put on social media. You know, there's there's people who have lost their kids, you know, and, and you're sitting there, you're, you know, he's a druggie, he's a junkie. I mean, mm-hmm. I've heard people say they deserve to die. I mean, some of the public comments under these articles are disgusting. Just be, you know, realize social media travels like that. Just think about what you say on, you know, in a public social media type environment. Mm -hmm. Be sensitive. There's so many people that have lost their loved ones. I think it's just two words, be kind, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Anna? Um, I think I wanted to expand, if I could, on the medicated assistant treatment. 
Um, I too, like Ted, uh, believe it has a purpose, but I don't believe it's a lifestyle. And access just through an emergency room isn't as easy as that sounds. An emergency room isn't there to be a medicated assistant treatment resource. And some of these medications, you can't just take them. What they could do is throw you into a horrible withdrawal if it's too soon and you're utilizing uh, Suboxone. If it's Vivitrol, you have to have drugs out of your system for two weeks before you can even interact with it. If it's methadone, they usually start you too low and then they, they bring you up to a dose that's not even like you are nodding out in your groups that are mandatory. And uh, Subutex and buprenorphine and some of the other you know products that are utilized are marketable on the street. So if it's not a controlled situation, if you're if educating parents even how to use a drug test, like I provide that as an option for parents in the groups also, $5, 12 panel, it has Suboxone and Methadone on it. If your kid's in a program that, you know, they should be, you know, doing random urine tests. It should be every day. I don't know why it's so random, but you can have that as a tool also at home to start building trust with your family member. And if Suboxone doesn't come up on the drug test, they're more than likely selling it and not taking it. And then hence, you know, an opioid is probably going to pop up anyway. On the, but the conversation helps the person with the substance use disorder say, no, man, I can't do that. My mom's got a drug test. It helps to create a new, the cognitive behavioral therapies that are utilized to change the language and skills that are needed to live with the disease and not die from it. So I'm a big fan of, and I say big, but it's really only for an opiate and an opioid that these replacement programs are necessary. It does have some alleviation and craving with alcohol. There's statistics to move whatever conversation you needed to move, but it's not a lifestyle. It's my personal opinion. Again, I'm not a doctor. And before I, I stop, um, I just wanted to say in regards to education and resources and how you can help, this is the person you can help to collaborate with in your town to make a difference and become part of the solution. And I also have a program that was put out by um, drugfreeworld.org. If you're not aware, it's free. And it can be utilized in school systems starting at the age of 10. It's, it has videos, PSAs, nothing longer than nine minutes, because usually we lose attention, right? Especially a younger adult, impulsive brain, <coughs> undeveloped cognitive, you know, prefrontal cortex, all that good stuff. And there's a whole semester of curriculum for homeschool parents and teachers that can utilize it in a school system. And like I said, it's free. And their website, drugfreeworld.org, is really jazzy to the young eye. It's, it's pretty cool, interactive, and um, if anything, it's about attraction, not promotion. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You want Thanks, some. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anything that you'd like to make sure you don't leave here without saying tonight? Yeah, just, um, you know, recovery is possible. Like, you know, there's a lot of examples here tonight that have, have spoke on it, you know. And um, to anybody who hears this, like, if you reach out and, like, you admit that you need help, like, that doesn't make you weak. You know, I used to think that, you know, by, by admitting that I needed help, I was a weak person. But sometimes it takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. and determination to actually say, you know what, I can't do this by myself. I need help. And you know what, there's people out there who can help. You know, we don't, in, unless you're reaching out, you know, they, my father always said a, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So thank you. That's a great way to end. Well, thank you so much to the panelists, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you.